Hi, everyone. Welcome back once again. You are on the No CD Wednesday night webinar. I am Patrick McGrath, clinical psychologist, head of clinical services for No CD. And No CD has teletherapy available. 27 states currently. Goal to be in there by all 50 of them by the end of the year. Continuing to get more and more insurance companies covering us all the time. Looks like uh, Kaylee behind the scenes. Hello, Kaylee. Behind the scenes, Kaylee. That's what we'll call her tonight. Uh, popped up the old the little yellow box up there with the blue hyperlink. Feel free to go right there. If you have any questions, talk to our care team. Free 15-minute call. See what we can do. See if we can get you set up with one of our licensed, specialty-trained OCD therapists throughout the U.S. Oh, the questions are coming in already. I, please note the quote that I put in there first. Uh, just a little fun quote from the greatest band ever in the world. These these three lads back here, Rush, Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, Neil Peart. Greatest band ever, by the way. If you don't agree with that, you're wrong, just so you know. All right, uh, let's, let's go through. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Muhammad. Hello, Leonardo. Hey, D. Zoya. <laughs> All right, here we go. How do you deal with OCD trying to convince you that you've cheated on your partner and you have just forgotten? It went from overanalyzing situations that actually happened to now claiming that I actually slept with someone and just forgot. How do you deal with such outrageous claims so uh, that feels so real? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. And the reality comes down to this. Are you willing to sit with the discomfort that OCD throws at you with these questions without doing anything possible to investigate it? I've had patients who have badgered people uh, to see, hey, did I say anything inappropriate to you? Could you could you please confirm to me if I did or didn't, right? And of course, when they say you didn't, they don't believe them. I mean, here here's here's what's really interesting, right, about OCD and, and really in many ways anxiety disorders in general. But here's what's really interesting. If you asked Zoya 100 of your friends, do you think that I cheated on my partner? And 99 of them said, no, <laughs> come on. What do you think? You, no. And one said, I mean, I don't know, maybe. Your OCD would go with, wait a minute. One of them said, maybe. That's probably the truth. That's probably the right one. We should really go with that one and believe them and now bug the crap out of them to tell me why they believe maybe I could have done such a thing, right? And on and on and on. and Oh, overwhelming, isn't it? Just absolutely overwhelming. So I like how you hear uh, basically say, you know that these are outrageous claims. So maybe that's your, your clue right off the bat. Why believe any outrageous claims that your brain throws at you and maybe just throw those into the pile of, well, that's an OCD claim. And I've decided that I'm not going to believe OCD claims because I haven't yet met an OCD claim that is true. Right. I, I've never seen one in, in my years of treating OCD. Have I, have I seen an OCD claim that's true? I've seen tons of OCD claims that are, but what if, but what if, right? Or, but what if this, what if that? You know, it's all what if kinds of claims. I, I haven't seen a truth one as of yet. So I'd say outrageous equals OCD, which many of you could probably apply to your own lives, right? That outrageous equals OCD. Because it's all what if based kinds of stuff. 
OCD lives in the what if world. We live in the reality world. Those are two very separate worlds. They, they don't mix well with each other, right? They're oil and water. But OCD keeps trying to draw you in to the what if world to get you to think, but, but, but maybe this, maybe this is the time that the what if world is correct, right? So Zoya, uh, what if before, uh, right before I got on here, um, I went upstairs, I ran outside, I ran down my street, tearing all my clothes off, streaking the neighborhood, uh, all the while coughing, maybe spreading COVID to all of my neighbors and um, carjacking someone. And now I've got a Rolls Royce sitting in my driveway. I mean, it's an outrageous claim, right? But according to here, my if if I had OCD, it could convince me that I could have done that. So maybe I should take a, a moment right now from the from the webinar and just go upstairs to see if there is a Rolls Royce in my driveway, because there is a possibility that I carjacked a Rolls Royce. Well, I mean, I know it sounds outrageous. I, <laughs> you know, hey, there's there's not too many Rolls Royces in my neighborhood. I mean, you know, you know, you know we don't. We're kind of more of a you know Ford, Chevy, Honda you know, kind of neighborhood. Uh, we're, we're not of the Rolls Royce type, but it is outrageous. And, and, and it could live in very easily in the what if world, right. And in, in the what if world, like, I, I mean, I hell, I could, I could have done it. So maybe I should just go check right now to see if, if I did. And maybe I need to then go apologize to all the neighbors for running down the street half naked uh, and coughing on them and potentially spreading COVID. Cause what if I, I have it, I may well in the what if world, I, I could very well have it. So I got a lot to make up for. We'll see. Okay. Uh, let's see. Rich or risk. Maybe that's a typo. Um, Oh, hey, Rich. Yes, it says we filmed something about OCD together. Hey, good to see you again, Rich. Hey, glad glad you're here. Hmm. Also, uh, back to Zoe again. How do you deal with feeling irresponsible for not doing your compulsions? OCD tells me I'm ignoring an important problem, like cheating on my partner, by not constantly mentally reviewing false memories, even though that always leads me to the conclusion that I didn't cheat. Well, I don't see a reason to review a false memory. I mean, well, well, okay, well, okay, okay. I'm going to go back and review the Rolls Royce that I just that I just carjacked. It's silver. It's got a really nice hood ornament on it. The interior has this really nice red piping along the seats, though. It's God, it's beautiful. That leather is just, I think. Anyway, the softest leather that I've ever felt because I think I did it. And so I, if I did steal that Rolls Royce, I obviously would have felt how soft and supple that beautiful leather is on the inside of it. And I mean, even like the cup holders are lined with diamonds. It's, it's incredible how, how amazing and beautiful and opulent that car is that I might have hijacked or carjacked earlier while running down the street half naked, coughing on my neighbors, giving them COVID. Um, gosh, I hope the police don't show up while I'm doing this webinar tonight. That would be really awkward to get arrested in front of all of them. But huh, yeah, I could do what some people with OCD do preemptively and just call the police on myself and tell them that I might have done these things and just tell them to come because it's probably inevitable that they're going to show up anyway. And 
come and take me. And, and so maybe I could just do it now. I, well, I've just broadcast this out. So now it's out there. So I'm sure the police are probably listening to this broadcast anyway, because they were looking for the carjacker who was running half naked down the street, coughing on people anyway. So the likelihood is I won't make it through this entire uh, broadcast tonight because I will, I will be uh, arrested. And now as I'm reviewing the memories of the carjacking, I, I think I might remember what the person looked like as I carjacked them. And I think there was a look of terror on their face because I, I, I really do wonder. I, well, no, I don't wonder. I, I really think that I did pull somebody out of a silver Rolls Royce with lovely supple leather seating with excellent red piping and a diamond encrusted cup holder on it. So, um, and I, I think I parked it in the driveway, probably backed it in. Actually, I would of course want it facing out so I could have a quick escape out the driveway in case anybody were to come after me for it. But I'd, so I'd, I'd really want to do that, uh, to, just to make sure that I could get out right away. Um, so that's, that's what I think might've, might've occurred as I review my false memories now about all of this, you know, false memories seem to be kind of fun. You know, no, no one's false memories in OCD are anything good though. It's not like, you know, well, that night with the most romantic person in the world, just what a great time we had. And it was awesome. Unless of course that false memory is because I did that to cheat on my spouse or partner or whatever it would be. Then, then of course, then it would be just awful and horrible to have that false memory. But but if I didn't have a type of OCD, what a wonderful memory that would be. So if that was my type of OCD where I would be fearing cheating on my spouse, then then I might actually enjoy the false memory of carjacking the Rolls Royce because then I can just think about all night how, how awesome it was driving my false Rolls Royce around in my false memory of my Rolls Royce that I falsely stole in my false memory of stealing Rolls Royce while falsely running around my neighborhood half naked coughing on the false children in the neighborhood because they weren't really out there, but maybe they were, because what if they were? And and maybe I falsely gave them the COVID that I might or might not have, who who really knows? But I could falsely call the police now in reference to all of that too, just to be sure. And you could all falsely watch me get arrested for all of this as well. Maybe, right. I don't know. We'll, we'll just, uh, we'll just have to see. Okay. Is OCD related to depersonalizations and derealization, also psychosis? Uh, well, uh, not doing your ritual or, or compulsion, right, could lead you to have many of those types of symptoms. Many people report uh, panic-like symptoms, and derealization and depersonalization are listed in the panic symptoms. And so it would be a potential that somebody could have some of those symptoms. So, yes, there can be absolutely a relationship as well. And in terms of psychosis, the thing that I see related to psychosis and OCD is people with OCD fearing as many ways possible, could this be psychosis? So that's the relationship that I see with psychosis. Yeah. Oh, Rich, you spelled your name right this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> How do I uh, separate my OCD and anxiety from my own self? Well, uh, I, I guess, I guess that in some ways, do you? I mean, is, is OCD a part of you and the anxiety a part of you? So isn't that a part of yourself? So there's, there's that way to look at it, but maybe, maybe the question is, is not, how do you, how do you not just identify as whatever your OCD tells you? Right. And, and that is to actively do exposure and response prevention to challenge your OCD so that you show your OCD that your boss and it's not the boss, right? I think of that. You're not the boss of me now. You know, you could all sing that to your OCD you know, and get it to recognize that it's it's just a nanny nanny boo boo pants or whatever slang you'd like to call it. But I'm going with nanny nanny boo boo pants tonight. So that's what I'm going to call all of your OCD this evening is nanny nanny boo boo pants. Okay, <laughs> so we'll we'll just do that. Uh, Jorlin. How do you deal with guilt or shame with harm OCD? Well, what is there to feel guilty or shame about with harm OCD? I mean, they are thoughts or images or urges. They are, they are not actions. So, um, Jorlin, I'm wondering how much guilt or shame I should have now for the false memory that I have, but maybe it's not false. What if it isn't of running down the street half naked, which 
could be traumatizing in and of itself for many of my neighbors to see me running down the street half naked. I think that many would require some help after that uh, while coughing the COVID on all of the children of the neighborhood and then carjacking the um, the Rolls Royce. And, and maybe in the carjacking of the Rolls Royce, I jacked that guy up pretty well that I carjacked it from too. So I'm wondering, Jorlin, how guilty I should feel now about the potential uh, jacking up of the guy I carjacked <laughs> because I, I, I believe I beat the crap out of him actually, as I pulled him out of the Rolls Royce. Uh, I, I think I might've broken his Rolex too, uh, in, in the process, but I really wanted that supple leather red piping line seating with the diamond encrusted, the diamond encrusted cup holder is just the greatest thing ever. I mean, my, my, you know, my glass of pop sits in there so nicely with the nice straw. It's it's lovely. It's just lovely. So it was worth it. But wait, now if I think it was worth it, am I then saying that it was worth actually harming someone to take their car? Ooh, now I have to wonder what that means about me that I might have thought that it would be worth it to steal a car from someone and in the process of stealing the car for some really harming them while I was doing it as well. Gosh, what an awful, horrible person I am for such a thought even. I can't believe that I would even do such a thing or even entertain the possibility of having done such a thing. I mean, it's frightening. <laughs> or maybe it didn't happen. But maybe it did because I'm having some, you know, having some false memories about it. Dobby, house elf, uh, is facing uh, HOCD for the past six months. You know, I wish, and for those of all of you who are on the app as well, too, I, I'd like to say this. I wish that we would not call it HOCD anymore, and we would call it orientation OCD. And I, I'm, I'm going to put something out on our app about that. I'm, I'm going to write up something because... HOCD is kind of the old original name for it. And it was, you know, people who were straight at identifying a fear of what if I were to be gay, not out of a hatred of gay people or anything of that nature, just out of a, what if I'm suddenly identifying as something that I'm not, but it could be, you know, gay people who fear what if they were straight or trans people fearing that they weren't trans or, or all those kinds of things. So I'm going to work on insisting and putting out on the app that we start calling this orientation OCD. Maybe we'll call it OOCD or OOCD. <laughs> we call it that OOCD. Maybe I have a false memory of what if I was turning gay while running down the street as well too, that I, and then carjacked the Rolls Royce with that beautiful leather with the red piping on it and the diamond crusted cup holder. <laughs> it's beautiful. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to work on that. Ooh, CD thing and see where we go. Jennifer is so worried about jail time. Okay. Um, and I'm worried. I, you're worried you blackmailed someone and you've thought much about it and you believe you did it and you're freaking out so badly. Uh, okay, well, um, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. If you did, then we come up with a plan for what we do. And if we didn't, we work on moving on. But here, here's the thing. And here's where the OCD potentially comes in. You're not going to believe that you didn't do it, right? I mean, no one with OCD can be convinced that they didn't do something. But everyone with OCD can be convinced that they did do something. I'm going to say that again because I've never said it that way before. And that's one of those moments where I'm... Dr. McGrath takes a moment to write something down because, you know, once every six months or so, he says something that he really likes and thinks that it's cool. So OCD, uh, let's see, you cannot be convinced when you have OCD that you didn't do something. Right. 
write this down. But you can always be convinced that you did do something. I like that. So, Jennifer, I can't convince you that you didn't do it, but OCD definitely can convince you that you did. <laughs> and you're not going to believe me. But you will believe the conniving mental health issue that has invaded yourself and believe that to be true. So, sometimes people ask me, well, how do I get around this? And, and my standard reply is always this. If your best friend came up and, to you and told you that they were afraid of this, what advice would you give them? Because we're typically very good at giving advice to other people, even though we suck at taking it ourselves. So I want you to think about what would be the advice that you would give someone else if they were in this situation. Okay. Reminder, everyone, welcome to the Wednesday night webinar brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable free app through the iOS or Google Play. <laughs> I did not say PlayStation this time. And uh, to uh, learn more about OCD, if you want to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of our care team members, go up to the little corner over there, click on that hyperlink, or go to treatmyocd.com, and uh, we would be happy to chat with you about our teletherapy service and how we might be able to assist you. And we have this whole get better phase where we actively do treatment, and then we have a stay better phase where we will stick with you after that active get better phase and we will continue to work with you on other concerns that you may have or be there for booster sessions and support and all of those types of things too we've got daily messaging available that we can do alongside of all of these things There's a lot of great stuff so check us out to see if we might be able to assist all right Remy or Remy. I found that ERP helped loads with your physical compulsions. Wonderful. You're still struggling with intense intrusive thoughts. Is it worth looking into TMS alongside continued therapy? Well, I would say, uh, I mean, it is a potential. It is FDA approved now for OCD, but check to make sure your therapist is really aligning you with good ERP work for intrusive thoughts as well, too. Now, some of the therapy tools on the NoCD app can be helpful in this situation, such as creating loop tapes of some of the intrusive thoughts and listening to those things over and over again until you're basically bored with them because you're like, oh my gosh, if I have to hear this one more time, I'm just going to scream. Okay. Now, we have those tools on the NoCD app, so download the app. But really, check out one of our therapists who can help kind of guide that whole process for you, okay? We want you to work with someone professional on this who can really assist you and get you going on that. If we can get you into our uh, stay better phase, then we can be with you for a long period of time of your life as you continue to work on overcoming your OCD. So let's really, uh, let's see if we can get you in to, to help you out with that. Hi, Michael. Any suggestions on ERP exercises for the fear of psychosis? Um, well, interoceptives are great. Interoceptive ERP is uh, exposure and response prevention to feared physical sensations. And, and you can do one specifically for things that would be around things like derealization or depersonalization. If you go on YouTube, everyone, and I want you to go to YouTube and in the in the search bar for YouTube, I want you to type in natural hallucination and you will get a really cool video that's going to like do this to you after a while and everything. And it's it's really fascinating and it kind of throws off your visual perception and all sorts of things and makes you feel all kind of wonky and stuff. And it, those types of things are stuff that I utilize for the fear of psychosis. There's also psychosis simulators. I think you can watch some of those on YouTube as well, too. So you might want to watch some of those things and then just use those as your ERP. Those would be things that I would have people do in therapy sessions that I was working on, on with as well, too. So again, doing some of this in conjunction with a good therapist is going to be the most helpful thing to you. Because of course, all advice tonight is general purpose stuff. But if you're going to start doing good ERP work, really consult with somebody along the way. 
can HOCD, we're going to call it OCD or orientation OCD, make you afraid of getting back the attraction from the gender you were attracted before? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. You know, it can be OCD can make you afraid of anything. So if anyone's going to ask another question tonight about could OCD do this? The answer is sure. Of course, it, it can do whatever the heck it wants to. It could make you afraid of any possible thing whatsoever. Like that I carjacked a Rolls Royce, which is now sitting in my driveway facing on the outway so that I can get away from here quick if the police come to arrest me for having carjacked the OCD and beating the crap out of the person that I carjacked it from. And I broke their Rolex too. I think. Because it might be a real memory, but it might be a false memory. I can't. I still don't know. Crusher. <laughs> you haven't found the courage to embrace uncertainty. You bottomed out many years ago, then found ERP, but now the bottoms seem endless. The illusion that I can think up certainty seems very real. Uh, where can one find the willingness to change? Well, I would take a look at, you know, the NoCD app is great with the community and, and ask others, right? And there's probably going to be people here tonight as we scroll up who will give you kind of what it took for them to find the willingness to change as well too. But ultimately, Crusher, I want to ask you this question. Um, what is wrong with uncertainty? Now, Crusher, I'm going to do to you what I've done to other people along the way as I've done this. Crusher, uh, every time you get in your car, you have uncertainty as if you will make it there to where you're going or not, right? Now, you may not think about it, but that uncertainty, whether you think about it or not, is always there. So, Crusher, if you absolutely aren't going to accept uncertainty, I would like you to send the title of your car to the NoCD headquarters along with your keys, and then I will take it from you off your hands so that I can remove some of the uncertainty of your life by taking driving away from you. Now, you also have uncertainty just walking. You never know if you might trip on something, right? So maybe you should never walk anymore. But then if you sit all day long and don't walk, you could potentially develop blood clots in your legs. So there's some uncertainty there. So here's the deal, Crusher. You live with uncertainty every single day and just don't pay any attention to it because it's not anything your OCD gives a turd about. Right? But the things OCD does care about, then it says, well, those are the uncertainties that you can't accept. So it's interesting. You can accept some uncertainty unless OCD has said you can't accept it. Or you already know how to accept uncertainty. You're just not applying that knowledge to everything in your life. And you're categoriz categorizing things as some things are okay to be uncertain about, but other things are not okay to be uncertain about. That doesn't really work, does it? <laughs> Thank you, Richard. I'm a hero. I appreciate that. Although, as Rush once said, nobody's hero, right? Look up that great song, by the way. Uh, let's see. How do you... Uh, hi, Jennifer. Uh, uh, oh, well, Jennifer, we answered that one already. So uh, we'll, we'll go back with it. Oh, Jennifer goes back to something here, uh, adds to it, and says that you did do something consensually because you were involved in something where people wanted these things consensually done. Well, then if you consensually did something and other people were willing participants in it, it sounds like there's uh, there's not much to be uh, fearful of if, if that was the case, right? So uh, now you can, of course, have OCD about it, but... You know, you're, here's one of those situations where you're going to seek reassurance and you're going to, but you yourself have already answered your own question. So we're not going to do any more kind of reassurance. One answer is enough. Uh, let's see. We got that one. You're welcome, Zora. Zoya. How do I know that something that happened when I was a kid wasn't my fault? Also, can that be PTSD and it can contribute to OCD? Well, um, <laughs> let's see. One other person just wrote on here. I'm Dave from, Dave from Newsroom and Kid in the Hall. I like that. Thank you. Joshua, let's talk about that for a moment, okay? 
how do you know that something that happened when you were a kid wasn't your fault? I don't know. I, I don't have a time machine, so I have no way of going back in time to know that or not. And as we said already, since your OCD leans toward it is your fault, I'm going to bet you've already asked multiple people if it's your fault, and they've all said no, but you don't believe them. So the the question, Joshua, that, that might be more important is, why don't you believe people who tell you it wasn't your fault and only believe people who agree with your OCD? That might actually be the more important question here. Right? I believe it is the more important question. I can't convince you that something was or wasn't your fault. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Now, can a traumatic experience contribute to OCD? Sure, absolutely. Uh, about half of people with OCD will be able to tell you some really difficult experience they went through that might have been the thing that kicked it off. That kind of goes along with that diathesis stress model, that idea that uh, we all have potentially some genetic predispositions toward things, but we need the right stressors to kick them off. So there's a lot of people who can tell you that. But there's other people, about, uh, the other half of people with OCD who say, either I just always had it or one day it was there and I can't really tell you why or, or something like that. So there's not a one-to-one -one correlation here that we can that we can go off of. Danielle, uh, new, first-time caller. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, and dealing with POCD and orientation OCD since April, started Prozac, uh, says that wasn't very helpful. Happy you weren't going crazy and there is some hope. Well, I'm glad that you believe that there's hope too, because there is hope. So Danielle, wonderful. Welcome to the community. Glad to have you here. And yes, there is hope. And that's why we do this webinar every week to kind of show people that, that there is hope for things, right? There definitely there definitely is hope for something. One of the ways to get hope is to download the NoCD app on Google Play or iOS and um, consult one of our care team members for a free 15-minute call if you're considering teletherapy with a NoCD therapist who are trained in OCD and ERP. And you can go to treatmyocd.com or go up to the little yellow box right up there in the corner, hit that little blue hyperlink, and we'll get you set up for that. And we continue to take more and more insurances all the time. Mark, how do I deal with sleep paralysis and orientation nightmare occurring at the same time? Like uh, orientation nightmares aren't bad enough on their own. Sleep paralysis makes everything almost traumatizing. Uh, you know, that's an interesting question and don't know, but I'm going to write that one down and maybe that will be something if, if uh, you know, we can talk about sleep actually know somebody who does some sleep stuff on the webinar. Let me see what I can find on that. All right. I'll be the first to admit when I don't know an answer to something, and that would be one that I'm just not sure on, but I can try to find out some answer for you. I'm not going to just make something up there. Yes. How are you? How do you deal with the thought of if I don't have OCD and I don't let it go to me, I'll become a bad person. Uh, that is worded, worded and a little, I, I, let me see if I can try to figure that out. If I don't have OCD and I don't let it go, I'll become a bad person. Well, maybe, maybe this whole idea that what you're trying to say there is that um, how could these thoughts make me a bad person or, uh, but if, but if I could say that they're OCD thoughts, maybe I'm not. A, but but if I don't have OCD and I have these thoughts, then maybe I am a bad person. And I don't judge anybody for any thought that they have. I mean, yeah, I'm going to go back to my horror film example. We pay people to come up with really sick, disgusting, twisted things in a script and then produce it into a film. And then we pay money to go watch those films to watch these sick, disgusting, twisted things that somebody thought up. And we're like, oh my God, that was a great film. Did you see the 978 different ways people were murdered and mauled and destroyed in that film. That was awesome. So it's fine for that person to have written it in a script, but for you to have a thought like that is, oh, ah, no, 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 can't allow that. Just like I can't allow the fact that I might have carjacked a Rolls Royce earlier today, which is sitting in my driveway, maybe 
I haven't gone upstairs to check, but I think it might be. And I broke someone's Rolex as I was carjacking them. But it does have that beautiful leather with the red piping and the diamond encrusted cup holder, which I just think is the greatest thing ever. As I was running toward the Rolls Royce fast naked through my neighborhood, coughing on the children in the neighborhood with, with the COVID that I might or might not have from the false memory that I have about maybe or maybe not getting it. I don't know. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sarah. Can OCD be a separate voice outside of you and then you can learn to deal with the thoughts or is it just in your head? Well, I mean, it's in your head, definitely. So, but you doesn't matter you, you learn how to deal with it and, and you could just get to that point of being, oh, well, there's another one of those weird OCD things. Yeah, moving along, <laughs> whatever, right? Kind of like my tinnitus, uh, for those of you who aren't sure what tinnitus or tinnitus is, it's uh, a ringing in the ears. It's caused by a inner ear damage. So to me, it always sounds like I walked out of a Rush concert and I believe me, I've been to 30 of those. So I know what it's like to walk out of a Rush concert and have that ringing going on. And now sadly, permanent. <laughs> So I'm always hearing something that none of you are hearing. So I learned to deal with it. It's pretty loud now because I'm talking about it, but it's going to fade in the background again. And there are points that I won't register it, even though I am hearing it, right? And that's where we kind of would like with OCD too. Yeah, you might not register it. You might be always hearing something, but you don't have to register it. So. Is there a certain medicine that works best for OCD uh, and to lower anxiety? Well, people typically try SSRIs and you try maybe two of those first before you would go on uh, clomipramine or anaphronil, which is a uh, tricyclic antidepressant. So uh, people hold off on that one at first because it's got more side effects because it affects three neurotransmitters instead of one. So, uh, but uh, there are some genetic tests people can take too now to see which of the medications might work better for them than others. Is it possible for OCD to eventually turn into PTSD? I feel like eventually, I feel like it eventually is not a direct thought, but old experiences that were negative. Uh, I haven't seen OCD turn into PTSD. So I, I haven't seen it. I'm, I, I'm not going to say it's not, but, uh, but I don't know how, how it would turn into PTSD. Um, it's almost, I mean, PTSD is the experience or witnessing or confronting event events that involved actual threat and death, serious injury or sexual violence towards yourself or someone else. Um, so, so for PTSD, you would, you would have to have something have happened to you or someone you love or know, or hear about it happening to someone, you know, or work on a job that, uh, has these things kind of repeatedly coming up all the time, like a 911 operator or something like that. So, so, um, Maybe, Sal, if there's some more on that, you can let me know what, what you exactly mean by that one. Uh, Dobby asked about help for orientation OCD. So Dobby, reach out to a therapist through uh, OCD potentially to get that help. I mean, there's there's nothing that I'm going to say on this webinar that's going to help anyone who has orientation with OCD by by me saying, now listen, <laughs> you you know that's not true. You, you know what you are. It's okay. Stop, stop that worrying about that. that that's not going to work. So reach out to a therapist who can really help walk you through the process of doing exposure and response prevention to sit with the concerns and the fears that you have. But there's, there's not one ounce of reassurance that I could give you tonight that would convince you 100% that everything's okay in the way you want it to be for no matter what type of OCD is, be it orientation or contamination or harm or, or whatever it would be. It's just not possible, right? I mean, I don't have 100% reassurance that I won't change my orientation in the next two days or one day or three hours. I'm totally fine with that. I, I don't need a 100% guarantee. But your OCD is telling you that you do need a 100% guarantee. But it's also set up that it will never let you believe the 100% guarantee either because A, the 100% guarantee, first of all, doesn't exist. Or B, 
you have OCD and you have its nickname is the doubting disorder. You're going to doubt whatever you hear from anybody anyway. So if you want a great guarantee for failure, it's have OCD and demand to get 100% reassurance that convinces you that your OCD is wrong. That that's just going to fail. It's just not going to work because it doesn't work that way. It's just not the way that it goes. Anna is hearing the opposite part of OCD. So I like I have harm OCD, but lately I think I'm not going to die. I don't want anything bad to happen over and over again. Uh, well, uh, if you're thinking that that might be the compulsion that you're doing is, is a way to try to tell you that something bad's going to happen. So you keep telling yourself that nothing bad's going to happen to you or you're not going to die. And that might be your compulsion. So what I want you to do is stop saying that and or work on stop saying that and sit with the notion that we are all going to die. It is going to happen. We don't know when. Most of us don't know when at least or how or anything like that. But it is going to happen. So, we'll, so it's it's about sitting with that and and going from there. All right. Fatima or Fatima. You have responsibility, OCD, and one of your fears is that the way you've been cooking and cleaning all your life might have been the wrong way since you don't like to read books on how to cook and clean because you're afraid that you'll find that there are things you don't know would a good exposure blah. Okay. Um, well, here's the thing. I love to cook. I might look at a cookbook the first time I make a recipe, maybe, but I almost never do after that. Cause then I always play with it. Now I have no culinary training whatsoever. So how do I know then that I'm cooking the right way? But then here's the problem. I remember watching on YouTube, there was, and it was hysterical. It was four Jewish women all tasting each other's brisket. And basically all of them slammed each other's brisket because it wasn't made the way they make their brisket. So what's the right way to cook a brisket? And how do I know? Maybe there's multiple ways to clean. Maybe there's multiple ways to cook. But my OCD doesn't like that. My OCD says there can be only one right way to do things and everything else is not the right way. So everything else is wrong. So I have to do it the one right way to make sure everything's okay. Well, that doesn't work. So how will we know? Well, maybe there isn't just one right way to do things. Maybe there's multiple right ways to do things. <sighs> well, that's mind blowing, isn't it? There could be multiple right ways to do something. There could also be multiple wrong ways to do something too. But when you're looking at something like cooking, which for most people involves opinion, right? Because some might say, well, you can't eat beef under a certain temperature. And yet there's steak tartare, which you could just order and have just raw beef, right? And then there's people like my dad who says, could you burn it and then throw it in an inferno for seven hours and then burn it again? And then I might eat it as long as there's no pink. I joked with my dad this weekend that I didn't know how good pork chops tasted until I cooked them myself because when he did them, they were just blackened hockey pucks with open pit barbecue sauce. They were, it was awful, horrible. But to him, that was the right way to cook. Because, you know, you don't want trichinosis, right? I mean, raw, raw pork could, could kill you. Oh my God. Ah! 
or you could just get it right to temperature. And once you're there, boom, you, then you're done. Right. So. <laughs> Mike has asked me to play some rush. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, next week, if I, if I figure out how to actually kind of like share something, that would be, that'd be fun. Thank you, Michael. Jared, can OCD cause me to think everyone is talking about me? I analyze all conversations and think deeply about how conversations actually mean nothing. It's terrifying. Well, the analyzation of this can, is analyzation a word? Wow, that just came. I have no idea if that's even a word or not. Well, if it's not, I just congratulate everyone. You saw the genesis of a uh, genesis of a new word, analyzation. Don't know if it is a word or not, but I'm going to go with it. I just made it up, and I'm going to copyright it right off the bat. It's copyrighted feature of this broadcast, analyzation. Just so you know, no one else is allowed to steal that. By the way, um, now can OCD cause me to think everyone else is talking about me? You know, I see that more in social anxiety disorder, honestly, than I do in OCD. And there's a lot of fears that people have with social anxiety disorder that people are laughing or talking about them. They think. Uh, falsely because of anxiety that everyone's paying attention to them, that they're the center of attention and all those types of things. So that's pretty common with anxiety. Gina, how about false memory OCD after a night of drinking? Is it common? <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be OCD. I mean, you know, uh, a night of drinking, we could just forget things depending on how much we drink, right? Now, OCD can come into that and then tell us all sorts of things that we might have done in the time that we were blacked out and don't remember, right? So there's where OCD can can take advantage of a situation like that, for sure. Which again, why? Not a great idea to uh, try to control OCD with drinking. You know who you are. <laughs> Emily starts No CDZ ERP program on Monday. Is there anything at all that she can do to prepare? Well, yeah, Emily, you're you you already have access to messaging, and so your therapist is hopefully messaged you, and um, you can start some of that com pre therapy conversation just to check in, say hi. Uh, you can load up everything on your No CD app with your obsessions and compulsions. Uh, so start doing that right off the bat. You'll you'll be able to jump right into therapy right away. So. Thanks for joining us, Emily. Good to see you. And maybe all of you, if you're looking for a therapist, can follow Emily's lead and uh, check out No CD, a uh, downloadable free app through the iOS or Google Play. And you can go up to a little corner over there to talk to our care team, as I'm sure Emily did, and uh, see if No CD therapy might be right for you. Or go to treatmyocd.com. Danielle asks, why these uh, POCD or orientation uh, subtypes now? I've been a wife for 10 years and a mom for 17 years. Uh, well, I don't know, other than OCD loves to flip around on things after a while. And if you, you know, suddenly kind of it gets bored with something, it'll jump to something else. I mean, we always talk about OCD picks on the thing that you love the most. And <laughs> I loved our our previous uh, guest too, we had a, who talked about now when her OCD picks on her dog and says, you're going to kill the dog. She thinks, oh, well, that means I really love my dog because that's why OCD picked my dog. We had such a great talk then. Thank you. That was so fun. Uh, let's see. Is there an average, hi, Jacqueline, is there an average amount of time for people to effectively manage their OCD? Would you say it takes years on average? Well, here's the research that we've done. Uh, Dr. Blair Simpson and her group are publishing something right now, a paper coming out. They did front-loaded ERP therapy with conjunction in conjunction with using the NoCD app, and they did it in eight weeks. Now, no CD, we're following something very similar to that. And, and that's kind of our jump point there for, for uh, things we've, we've modified slightly. But we're, we're seeing amazing results in weeks, not in years. 
but in weeks. So if that's not motivating, I don't know what is, that you can really see some amazing changes in weeks utilizing exposure and response prevention with a very well-trained therapist and all the ancillaries that we have with the app, with the tools and the messaging that we have available as well too. Give it a go. Yes, you are not alone. That is true. Hey, hey. Albert, why does this scary intrusive thought feel so real and scary despite you know it's irrational, but I keep checking my theme obsessively to feel real sure it's not true, but it's been going on for almost five years. And it will continue to go on, Albert, as long as you keep checking. There's there's no other more plain way to say it than that. If you react to it as if it is real, then it is going to feel real. Right? And then you get this relief after you check. You're like, oh, God, that felt so good. Felt so good to learn that that wasn't real. Which just reinforces you doing that over and over and over and over. And I could say that for five years, but I won't. I'll save us all from that. Because... uh in eight minutes when we're done here, I've got to go hide the Rolls Royce that I carjacked that's sitting in my driveway that has the diamond encrusted cup holder in it, which is beautiful. And the red leather piping on the supple leather seats that I carjacked from someone. And when I ripped them out of the car, beat them, broke their Rolex. And then I did that while running half naked down the street, coughing the COVID on all of the children in the neighborhood. So maybe. I don't know. Maybe I didn't do that either. I'll have to go check and find out. Okay. Um, (laughs) Leah says, I'm a lesbian who fears I'm straight. Thank you. You're welcome. See, that's why we're calling it orientation OCD. We're going to get rid of this HOCD thing. So we're Ansel too. All right. Good. See, I've got people on my side. Excellent. We're going to call it, I'm going to champion OCD, by the way. I'm just going to, I'm going to work on that. I think that it's, that could be pretty fun if we all just said that all the time. OCD makes sense. Thank you, Katie. OCD makes sense. Well, it shows you how far behind I am. Uh, Jeez, comment. Holy moly, do we have some chats tonight. Um, Okay. Abby. ERP is so hard for me because I get physically stuck doing my compulsions. My body will literally not let me move a muscle until I perform my mental compulsions. I cannot get past that yet. I wonder if I need meds to help. Abby, you're experiencing freezing. Freezing is always an interesting one. And that is the idea that if I were to move during a uncomfortable thought or image or urge and complete an action that I'm doing, like take a step or or touch something, then then there's like that's almost closing the circuit on on the thought or image or urge that I'm having. And it means that I actually wanted it to happen. Uh, I've seen this happen to an extreme where someone froze while getting uh, out of a bus and where as the bus took off, they were half in and half out of the bus and the bus actually ran over their leg and they still didn't say or do anything until they completed the the loop in their head before they screamed out to the bus driver that the bus driver was running their leg over. So, Abby, work with an OCD therapist if you have the opportunity to help you with this. Okay. This this is treatable, Abby, just so you know. It it really is treatable and there is help available for you. Let's see. Gina, would it be silly to ask a bar for camera footage as reassurance? Yes, but I'm glad you put the LOL after there that you already recognize that that was the case. But, you know, I see this a lot like with um, with uh, pedophilic OCD. Uh, uh, you know, a patient who once said to me, if I go to a mall and my wife has to go to the bathroom, before she goes, I find a camera and I stand under it and I stare at the camera the entire time while she's in the bathroom. And I wait there until she comes and taps me on the shoulder and goes again. And that way, just in case anybody would ever accuse me of potentially, potentially, right, doing something inappropriate with a child, there is camera footage to show 
that that was not the case. So yeah, um, camera footage is a big friend to people with OCD actually, because they think that they can utilize it as reassurance. That is for sure. Danielle, you're welcome. No problem. Uh, let's see. I'm currently obsessing about if my boyfriend of four years is too pushy or has been in the past. I have ROCD and this is my latest obsession. Any advice on how to expose to this or advice in general? Well, again, working with a therapist on this can definitely, you know, assist you where you might even create scripts where you think that your boyfriend was too pushy and you might listen to those over and over again and just kind of get used to hearing those things so that if they do pop into your head at some point, they're not a big deal anymore because you've already practiced listening to those types of things. So that might be one way off the bat that you could do it. I think that a therapist could really help guide you through writing some of those scripts or making some loop tapes around some of those things in order to really help you with that. Okay. Hey, another uh, first NOCD appointment coming up for Danielle. Congrats. Welcome. Welcome to the NOCD. Glad to have you here. <laughs> Crusher, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Crusher, giving us a rush lyric here. An ounce of perception, a pound of obscure, process information at half speed, pause, rewind, replay, warm memory chip. And, and in effect, isn't that interesting for OCD? Pause, rewind, replay. Pause, rewind, replay. Pause, rewind, replay. Rest in peace, Neil Peart. Greatest drummer and lyricist ever in the history of the world. Appreciate you. Uh, let's see. All right. right, let's. We've got three minutes left, so I'm going to try to pick something here. Ah, yes. Well, we never want to judge anyone on religious preferences. And we don't want to tell anyone to stop the religion that they're in, even if we don't agree with their religions. What we want to do is we want to help people figure out how do they live in the religion that they have chosen in a way that isn't going to be interfered with by OCD. That's ultimately the way that we want to go, especially with scrupulosity. Okay. So just something for people to think about. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Mike says he likes my humor. Thanks, Mike, because, you know, I, I like humor. And uh, I think that OCD takes away your ability to laugh and smile and to have a good time and to let your guard down and to enjoy yourself. And I want people to be able to laugh and smile and enjoy themselves and not have OCD be the thing that influences their life and gets in the way of living the life that they want to live. Well, with that, everyone, we have once again gone through an hour. Now, next week, I'm excited to announce next week, uh, being our third Wednesday of the month, is our Diversity Matters webinar. And next week, we'll be focusing on the interaction of autism and OCD. So bring your questions about autism and OCD. If you know someone who is on the autism spectrum or families who have a member of their family who, who might have someone on the autism spectrum, please have them join us next week because we're going to have some experts in next week to talk about what's the relationship between autism and OCD and how do you kind of define the differences between the two and where is it kind of murky in the water with all of that as well too. So look forward to having all of you back again next week. Remember, no CD downloadable free app on iOS or Google Play. We've loved having you here this week. Go to treatmyocd.com if you're looking for teletherapy. We're always, always, always happy to have you guys here. And we look forward to having you back again. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night.